Our study today is in Romans chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus, our Lord. And we pray that as we read through the book of Romans, that we might have a greater understanding of how we are called to respond to this wonderful gift of our salvation. That because Jesus lives, uh, we are uh, able to live for you. And so help us to understand what that means, to live uh, in grace and to live um, in repentance and to uh, walk away from sin. We pray that our lives may be a shining example of our love for you, even as you have shown us that perfect love through your sacrifice on the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so in in Romans chapter 6, we see Paul uh, continuing his argument. You know, he... Last chapter, he was talking about how Adam brought sin into the world and Jesus brought um, life into the world. And so just as one person could affect all people through his sin, so one person who, through a perfect life, could affect all people. So Jesus is actually doing, he's uh, undoing the death that Adam brought into the world. You know, the argument is that if one person can uh, affect everybody, through sin, then isn't it possible that one person through perfect obedience could affect all people? So G- Jesus is that only, he's the only person who's ever been perfect. But, you know, he did mention about how through one act of righteousness, justification was brought. So he's talking about, you know, the one disobedience of, um, that Adam did in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve, you know, rebelled against God and, and ate from the tree that they weren't supposed to. That brought sin into the world. But the one act of, of justification or obedience that Jesus did was his um, uh, death on the cross. I mean, Jesus did live a perfect life. But if he would have just lived a perfect life, that wouldn't have done anything for us. I mean, he, he would have just been able to go to heaven himself, as a, as a man, that is. But because he also died in our place and took the wrath of God from us, that perfect act of obedience... That one act of righteousness actually earned us heaven. So, so we see that it wasn't just that he was perfect, but that he did the will of God perfectly. So in chapter 6, it's talking about, you know, what, what is our response to this gift of salvation? Is the gift of salvation something that we can take for granted? Is it a license to sin? And so we'll see that that's, that's not true, but there were people, especially in the early church, who fell into this um, type of thinking, which is called antinomianism. Uh, ant- antinomianism comes from a Greek word that means against the law or anti-law. So a person who said that we don't need the law, we don't need to follow the law, we don't need to obey the laws, God forgives us, so we can, you know, whatever sins we do, it doesn't make any difference because God's going to forgive us. So, then, so this is exactly what he's con- confronting here. Okay, in chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Okay, so here... We have uh, Paul's explanation of how God has provided for our redemption in this section all the way through chapter 8. And so he's going to uh, cover um, three parts in the next uh, several chapters. Ch- chapter 6, 7, and 8 are kind of like a, a, a complete argument. Chapter 6, he's talking about um, freedom from, tyr- from sin's tyranny. In chapter 7, he's going to talk about freedom from the law's condemnation. In chapter 8, he's going to talk about life and the power of the Holy Spirit. In chapter 6, in this first part, when he said, he asks the questions. In Greek, when you ask a question, so in English, you know, when you, you just ask a question. But in Greek, there's two ways of asking a question. You can ask a question with the implication that the answer will be yes or no. So depending on how you an- ask the question in Greek, there are already we already know what his answer is intending for us to be. I mean, it's kind of obvious, but that's why in Greek there's actually a way to say, 
If you say, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Well, he, the way he says this in Greek is, is um, it's like saying, uh, is there any other way of, of uh, answering this question? If we, should we go on sinning so that grace may increase? And, is, and the answer in Greek is already implied in the question. And the, the, the answer, of course, is in verse 2 he says, by no means. But that's kind of a weak translation. The, um, the Greek actually says, absolutely not. Certainly not. It is, it is as firm a negative answer as you can get. I mean, it, it, he's saying that, that this is unimaginable, that there is no such thing as a person who is in the grace of God who wants to sin. People who want to sin do not have God's grace. If you have God's grace, then these two are mutually exclusive. They have nothing to do with each other. A person who loves the Lord does not want to sin. I mean, this is right out of the book of Proverbs. Uh, I don't know if I can remember the passage, but... There's, there's a passage in the Proverbs that talks about um, this very thing, you know, that if you uh, are a follower of the Lord, you believe in God, then what does that look like? Let's see, uh, it might be in Proverbs chapter 7. Let's see if I can find it. It's talking about the fear of the Lord and... Uh, Uh, when we fear the Lord, it means that we love what God loves and we hate what God hates. Well, there's several places in the book of Proverbs that talks about this very thing. But in particular, there was a passage where it talks about, you know, um, the person who loves the Lord, loves what God loves and hates what God hates. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know if I can find that passage, but it's in uh, chapter uh, 7 or 8. Uh, and the fear of the Lord is, the, is in the Old Testament means that we, um, that we have uh, reverence and respect, and actually it's reverential obedience to, to fear the Lord. Actually, in chapter 1, verse 7 of Proverbs, it talks about the fear of the Lord. Oh, here it is. I'm sorry. It's in chapter 8, verse 13. Okay, Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13 says, To fear the Lord is to hate evil. And then God says, I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior and perverse speech. And so we understand that. There's another place in uh, the Proverbs that says, you know, if you love the Lord, you love what God loves, and you hate what God hates. So, you know, even though it sounds, you know, maybe contradictory to say that God hates something, uh, the word hate is uh, is just a word that talks about you know rejecting something right so uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that God hates like we think of the word hate but it means that he, he certainly hates evil because he has nothing to do with it he rejects it and so if a person has the fear of the Lord that means if they have this relationship with God through their um, forgiveness and through their adoption as a child of God then a person would truly um, hate the same things God hates. So if sin is evil, the only way that you can be under God's grace is if you hate sin. And so per that doesn't mean that we stop sinning, it just means that we don't want to sin, and we certainly would never agree with this idea that we can sin so that God's grace could abound. So back in Romans chapter 6. So, and so verse 2, he, he said, um, chapter 6, 2, he says, By no means we died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? It, it, there's a, a kind of a... Um, the, the Christian life is, is kind of, it, in a way, it's kind of a... Uh, I don't know what... I'm trying to think of the word here. It, it's a now, not yet um, uh, life. We are certainly, right now, forgiven children of God but we are not yet free of sin. I mean, that's why we keep sinning, but we are free from the penalty of sin. So God doesn't count our sins against us, and so that means that we're not condemned, but we haven't, we haven't uh, gone to heaven yet, so we haven't escaped the sinful world. So, you know, we still live in a sinful body, we still have sinful thoughts, 
but that doesn't mean that those things control us. We can let them take us over and then we can fall into the trap of letting them consume us, but God has already forgiven us, so then we're supposed to live like the children God has called us to be. You know, it's like if uh, you got adopted by, you know, by Bill Gates, and then, you know, you have all these millions of dollars that are part of, you know, his inheritance to you, you know, why would you want to go down to Skid Row and live on the streets, right? You start living like the person you are, right? And as a Christian, we, you know, we don't, we don't eat out of the gutters or live on the streets. We are children of God. We have, uh, God has given us a new inheritance. And so to live like that is to have this attitude like I belong, I'm a child of the king, right? You know, why, why would you want to live like a poor person in the streets when you're a child of the king? You know, start living the way God, is, God, the way God sees you. And, and so he explains in verse three, don't you know that all who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? So he's, he's saying that baptism means that, that we have actually died. But it's not um, our spirit that has died, it's our old nature, our old Adam is what Paul calls it. So there's a part of us, there's a sinful part of us that is dead. And if it's dead, right, like if a person commits a, a, a robbery and then they die, can the law touch them any longer? Can you put somebody in jail who's dead? No, it's too late. They're already gone. They're beyond the, the reach of the law. So that's what it means for us. God's uh, condemnation for sin can't touch us because our sinful nature has died. It's beyond the touch of the law. We've already uh, been absolved of all crimes because our sinful nature has already died with Christ in our baptism. But baptism does something else for us. It it says in verse 4, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So there is a new life that has been raised. So Jesus' death and resurrection is a, a picture of the Christian life. Our sinful nature dies in the tomb with Jesus, and our new uh, spiritual self has been raised so we actually have a resurrection. There's the first resurrection and the second resurrection. The Bible talks about two types of resurrections. The first one is our spiritual resurrection where we were spiritually dead, but now we've been raised to become children of God in our spirit. And then we'll have a bodily resurrection on the last day when Jesus raises up all of our bodies. And then we'll have a, a, an incorruptible body, right? In 2 Corinthians, it talks about how the mortal will become immortal and the... And, um, the corruptible will become incorruptible, so our, our bodies will become uh, uh, no longer touched by uh, sin and death, just like Jesus. When he raised from the dead, he'll never die again. You know, his body was not confined by the things of this world. Remember how he was in the, the, the disciples were in the locked room, and he, and then he appeared there, right? He still had a body. He, they said, they thought he was a ghost, but he had a piece of fish and he touched him. They could see he was really a human being. So he had a new resurrected body, but that body was glorified and it was no longer confined to the things of this world. You know, he was in Jerusalem and then he appeared to the, the disciples on Emmaus, on the road to Emmaus. He was all over the place and he didn't walk to these places. He, he just uh, was able to go to uh, the different places because he was uh, able to, to, you know, to just to trans transfer to those places. Hi, Virginia. Good. Are you going to join us? No, because I'm waiting for my son. Oh, okay. Well, good to see you. How are you? I'm doing good. Nice to see you. Yeah. See you later. Okay. Okay. Okay, so in uh, so Romans chapter six verse five, then uh, Paul continues the argument and talks about how uh, you know that this the baptism that we have yeah, it it changes us. So you know we're not going to be like our old sinful nature. We're not going to want to sin. You know there are you know we still sin, but there's a difference between sinning and wanting to sin, right? God, you know Paul says you know. And elsewhere in one of his letters, he says, you know, um, shall we, uh, who will save me from this body of death? The sin that I want to do, 
or the, no, the good I want to do, I don't do, and the evil I don't want to do, that's what I keep on doing. And he says, who will save me from this body of death? So he's talking about, you know, there's that sinful nature that keeps trying to drag us down, but God has already given us a new spiritual nature that wants to do the things of God. So there's that struggle within us, the old nature pulling us and the new nature pulling us toward heaven. And, uh, you know, it's like, you know, it's like in a garden. If, you, if you're not weeding the garden, the weeds will take over and then the, the good plants will die. And you've got to, you know, tend to those things. You need to allow them to grow. The Christian life takes work. And, and ultimately, it's, it's an eternal uh, payoff, isn't it? Because if we ignore our spiritual garden, then we will, it, the weeds will choke out the faith, the, you know, and it'll die. But if we tend to it, it will grow and we'll attain to, to, to eternal life. Not that we earned it, but that you certainly can do something to prevent it from, uh, you know, the evils of the world from killing your faith. You know, Martin Luther said, once said that um, you can't stop the birds from flying overhead, but you can keep them from nesting in your hair. <laughs> so, you know, there'll be all kinds of th sinful things in the world. You can't stop those things from happening, but you can certainly stop them from, you know, taking... Uh, you know, setting up shop in your life. You know, you, you don't need to go ahead and, and give in to the world just because everybody else is doing it. Okay, so chapter 6, verse 5 says, If we have been united with him like, uh, if we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. So again, it's that, that argument that if you've died, then you, you know, if a person had, had, had you as a slave, once a person dies, the, there's no more slavery. It's over. You're, you're gone. You know, but because we've been raised to a new life, um, we don't belong to, you know, to the sinful world. The, and sin can't uh, claim us any longer. He tries. The devil's lies are that you don't deserve God's grace. You're never good enough. And then, you know, those, those lies have a seed of truth in them. We aren't good enough for God's grace. But that's what, why it's grace. Because it's undeserved, right? So, uh, so this idea that we're um, united with Jesus and his resurrection is, you know, is a powerful... Um, a powerful uh, gift, and it's the gospel message that Paul was preaching to everybody. You know, he was trying to tell this to the Jews and the Gentiles. For the for the Jewish people, you know, uh, the idea that they were slaves to sin was kind of a shock. Like, what? We've never been slaves to anybody. That's what the Pharisees tried to say to Jesus in John's gospel. They said, "Well, we we're children of Abraham," and he says, "No, no, you're children of the devil because." you continue to believe his lies, which were things like, you know, that Jesus had a demon in him and, or he was demonic. That's what they were saying. Uh, but if we're freed from those things, then that sinful nature has been done away with. It has no claim on us. Okay, in verse 8, Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we all, will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So Jesus' resurrection wasn't like Lazarus' resurrection. Lazarus was raised in a corruptible body that died again, right? He didn't live forever. But Jesus is raised as the first fruits of those who will be raised after him. So Jesus will never die again. Anyone who's raised in Jesus Christ afterwards at the last day, we'll never die again either. And, um, you know, he, he is um, trying to explain that, uh, you know, death has no mastery. Uh, you know, once he died, he died once for all. And, and then this new life is not a selfish thing. It's not like God raises us from the dead so that we can just, you know, do our own thing and ignore God. No, we have the, an eternal purpose of belonging to God. So we live to the Lord. So Jesus lived the Father's will perfectly, and when he was raised, he continues to do the Father's will perfectly, and that is like a good shepherd to bring all his sheep home. You know, And he, Jesus knows who those sheep are. 
right? Jesus says, my sheep know me. I, I call them by name. You know, that's, that's um, like uh, the predestination passages that talk about how God has chosen us. And so, um, you know, the difference is that's not like God chooses some people to go to hell. He does choose, as the good shepherd, all those who will listen to him. And he knows who they are. He calls them, they listen to him, they come to him. And those are his sheep. Those are the ones who have been uh, predestined for salvation. Those who reject God's calling and reject the good shepherd have chosen to uh, ignore Jesus or to not follow him. So God already knows who those people are as well, but it doesn't mean that he um, sends them away. They've only ignored his call. So we also live to the Lord. You know, there, there's a passage in Paul's letters that says, if we die, we die to the Lord. If we live, we live to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. And that, that's true for God's people. Uh, per, a person who doesn't believe in God, you know, they're going to die and they're going to be separated from God. They're not going to live for the Lord in this life or in heaven, or you know, because they rejected that. Okay, in, in verse 11, he says, In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey, obey its evil desires. So he's, he's not saying that by being raised to new life that there's no more sin in our lives. Again, it's that struggle between the new, um, the new self that God has resurrected in us and our old sinful self is tugging, trying to pull us away. There's a battle. Remember, Jesus, Paul talks about the battle that's within us. And, uh, and so notice that he says, do not let sin reign. What, that makes it sound like there is, um, you know, there, there is this battle within us and the, whoever is winning the battle is, has more control because to reign is what a king does when he's controlling. And a king only reigns over his subjects that um, either ha are um, subject to him or that he has power over. So whatever part of your body is being reigned by either sin or by God, it, then you'll see who's winning in the battle in your heart, right? Uh, how can we let sin reign? Does the devil have power to possess us? Do demons have the power to inflict, you know, terrible things on us? The answer is no, they have no power over us. The only power they have is that which is given to them. So that's why it's always dangerous to dabble in any type of occult, because the only way that people in the occult are able to do the, the things that they do, like witchcraft or sorcerers or, or palm readers, you know, those people that you see, there's right there on Van Buren, there's that, you know, there's a psych psychic right psychics are people who call upon the uh, demonic powers to give them insights that they would normally have but the only way they're able to do that is to uh, is to submit and open themselves to demonic uh, possession or other types of demonic uh, powers so that that's a danger there that the Bible is telling us that you know don't let sin reign or evil reign in your heart because once you give, let it have a foothold, then there is the danger of being taken over, right? The devil doesn't, you give him an inch, he'll take a mile, right? It, it's, not, it's not just a little bit. You know, what will the devil, uh, you know, what will he take to give you power? He'll take your soul, right? So what good does it uh, do a man, Jesus said, if we inherit the whole world or we earn the whole world but we lose our soul? You know, that's... Um, that's a big price to pay, and it's amazing that some people are willing to do that. Whether or not they officially do it, you know, like, I don't know if you know about um, Faust. There was a story in the Middle Ages about a, a man who uh, sold his soul to the devil so that he could be, you know, a famous and powerful ruler. And so uh, Faustus, you know, made this deal with the devil, and, he, he, you know, it's a, it's a classic story uh, that, you know, is your soul worth all this. It was funny because at the end of the story, you know, the devil claims that he has control over him, and yet that, that's the misconception. The devil never has any control over us. It's just the perception that he does. 
So even though he sold his soul to the devil, I think that at the end of the story, there was um, uh, the possibility that he, he, he considers the possibility that God's grace, since it's free, could save him, despite the fact that he may have sold his soul to the devil. And so that's true because uh, the devil w w tries to fool us into believing that if we sin, that that sin defines us. But instead, Paul is telling us that Jesus' um, stamp on our life and his gift of a new spirit and that resurrected self actually defines us because of what Jesus did. If Jesus died for our sins and we trust in him, that defines us, not our past sins or even future sins. You know, later on in Romans chapter 8, he says, you know, I believe that neither um, angels or demons, neither the present nor the future, nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And that, of course, is true. But the devil wants us to believe that, oh, no, you, you don't deserve God. And so you're too bad to be saved and, and tries to make us think that, uh, that we're lost. <clears throat> okay. In verse 11, he says, uh, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Okay, and we read this part where it says, don't let sin reign in your mortal bodies. Uh, okay, what, no, is this a repeat of what we just read, maybe? Um, well, I'll just continue reading this. Don't, don't let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God to, as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master because you are not under law but under grace. So, you know, so each one of these paragraphs is really repeating the same argument. But it's helpful to see, you know, each uh, part. It's not like Paul just gives us some type of philosophical idea and says, okay, you know, just think about that. But he, he gives us practical advice. In verse 12, if he's commanding us to not let sin reign, in verse 13, he also gives us the practical, practical advice of saying, do not offer the parts of your body to sin. How, how do we offer our parts of our body to sin? What does that mean? Okay, well, like what are, remember in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you know, it talks about how we all have different parts. Uh, the, every person is like a part of the body. You know, the hand can't say to the eye, I don't need you. And so we all have different things. So offering uh, our, the parts of our body to sin, you know, don't allow your eyes to look at something that you shouldn't. Don't let your hands, you know, do something they shouldn't. Uh, you know, whether it has to do with, you know, taking part in, you know, like Judas, where he accepted the money for the betrayal of Jesus. You know, his hands were sinning. And Jesus says, you know, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off, right? And he was using hyperbole to describe that it's better to get into heaven without a hand than it is to have all the parts of your body and go to hell, right? It's, it's that same thing about, you know, what good is it if you, if you gain the whole world but lose your soul, that idea. So not offering the parts of our body to sin or as instruments of wickedness yeah, is, uh, is what we should be doing during our lives, is, is looking at, at the things, you know, it's not just the parts of our body, but it has to do with every aspect of our lives. Are there parts of our lives that are in service to something other than God? You know, do we, is our money in service to the Lord or is it in service to something else? How about our time? How about our talents? You know, all, all the things that are part of our life can be used for good or bad. And he's saying, don't let them be used for evil, but, but offer them to the Lord. Because when we offer them to the Lord, he certainly will use them for his glory and also as a blessing to us. It's far more blessing in using the things in our lives and in our body for God. You know, you know I think about all your, the talents we have. That's part of our, of our body, you know, our voice to sing for the Lord our words as uh, encouragement to others, our um, concern, our thoughts, our prayers, lifting others up and, and blessing them as opposed to, you know, thinking evil thoughts, you know, envy and hatred and discord, the things that destroy the body of Christ. We, God says, you know, it, turn away from those things and then offer what you have to the Lord for, for good, not for evil. <clears throat> 
Mm, okay, and then he continues to say, uh, for, for sin shall not be your master, because you were not under law, but under grace. So one of the things that Paul says in his letters is he usually starts one of his letters by saying, I, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, but the word for servant is actually the word bond servant or slave. So he's saying, I actually have been purchased by Jesus. I belong to him. I am his slave. So that's why he's saying here, don't let sin be your master. In essence, you can't be a slave to sin because Jesus is your master and you are a bond servant or a slave to him. So usually the word slave has bad connotations. So most translations in English use the word, they translate that word slave as servant. So it's saying that we are servants of Jesus or slaves of Jesus, which is a good thing because if you have a good master, then you're part of the family as opposed to being a slave to sin where sin has no, you know, the devil has no desire uh, to make your life any better, you know. Anything that happens in the sinful world is not going to ever be a blessing to you. It's ultimately going to end to your, your um, eternal destruction. So, uh, and so he's telling us the truth is that we're not under the law, but we're under grace. So our real master is Jesus, not, not the devil and not, um, not sin. Uh, and that's why, if that's the truth, then we should live like that and not allow our sinful nature to control us. <clears throat> okay, so you know, he went over this several times in lots of different ways. Now in verse 15, he says, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. So he's practically saying the same thing again. He says, Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to somebody to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one, to the one whom you obey? whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. So it, it's helping us to see that there's a practical thing that whenever, whatever we do shows who our master is. That's kind of a dangerous thing because, you know, you think about, uh, you know, you think about it when we do something bad, you know, we allow our temper to get the best of us. We allow greed or envy or gossip, all those things. And those things are showing that we're allowing sin to be our master. But Jesus says, you know, he wants, he wants us to be under his authority. And that only happens when we, uh, when we follow his will and we, do, and we obey his teachings. Now, because of the, the fact that we still live in a sinful body, we're going to do sinful things. But... Um, but the, the fact is that Jesus already paid for those things. So when we do evil things, that doesn't mean that we're not God's children anymore. We've got to remember you know, that it's not like, you know, oh, I'm, a, I, I'm no longer a child of God. It's more like the prodigal son. Remember, the prodigal son was still the son of the father, but when he walked away from the father, he was lost and he was dead. So God in, uh, adopts you into his family through his grace, through faith, and we can walk away from that and so it's not like God said, well, I, I'll have nothing to do with you. No, it's, it's that when we sin, we're, it's like we're walking away from the Lord. It's like being a prodigal son saying, well, I don't need God. And God's uh, waiting for us to return. So repentance is, is turning around, walking away from sin and walking back to God. Uh, so he's talking about the fact that we're under God's grace. So He's saying, really, don't worry about your sin because it's not going to, it doesn't exclude you from God's kingdom. It only, it, you can exclude yourself from God's kingdom, though. So that, that's why he's saying, not, don't follow the, um, the sinful life. And uh, so he said, you know, don't you know, in verse 16, that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you're slaves to the one whom you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. So there's that you know, description of what it means to be a Christian. A Christian is a slave to righteousness. That means that we belong to, to Jesus, who is the righteous one, and our lives, uh, when we are in faith, we're actually, you know, we desire to do what's right. Uh, in verse 19, he, he explains this now. He says, I put this in human terms because you are weak in your, in your natural selves, 
Just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer them to slavery to righteousness, leading to holiness. So contrasting the old life, he's talking about these people before they came to faith. You know, the Roman Empire encouraged all kinds of the worshiping of idols, um, debauchery, you know, drunkenness and orgies and things like that. That was all part of, they didn't think there was anything wrong with the things they were doing. And God's saying, you know, that you gave yourself over to sin, but now you belong to Jesus, so don't live that old life. Give yourself over to the Lord. So there are things that we can do that can lead to holiness. That has to, and then, um, you know, he explains that, you know, in several places in his letters about what does that look like. But he's just talking about this in general here. In verse 21, what benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. Okay, so like if, you know, if you're getting drunk and partying and being promiscuous, those things only lead to death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So there's one of the, you know, the most famous passages in the Bible. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, um, that passage um, is also found elsewhere in scripture. Let's see here. Um, Genesis uh, 2, verse 17. Let's look at Genesis 2, 17. And so I think it's talking about the wages after Adam and Eve fell into sin. Well, actually, that's before that section. But Genesis 2, 17. Which says... Um, but. He says, you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good or evil, for when you eat it, you will surely die. So that was the first law and the first commandment. And they, you know, they brought death upon themselves when they disobeyed that. Let's see. And then the other one I want to look at is Proverbs chapter 10, verse 16. Proverbs 10, 16. This one is very similar to the passage we just read. It says, The wages of the righteous bring them life, but the income of the wicked brings them punishment. So that's, that's a proverb that says, you know, basically the same thing. And then I think Ezekiel 18.4 is another passage which says, The soul that sins shall die. So those are the places in the Bible that remind us that, you know, that sin only earns death. But... Faith and, and, the, and eternal life come from God as a gift. We don't earn them. We don't deserve them. They're, they're given to us because you know, we've, already, we've already earned death. So the only, only way we can have eternal life is if God gives it to us. And it comes to us through faith. So the two kinds of servitude are, were contrasted. Serving uh, sin and serving God. And when we... When we um, follow our sinful nature all we can do is earn death and and because of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross he has given us the gift of eternal life and, uh, and that comes only through faith so you know later on he continues that, to talk more about that earlier in the chapter he had talked about you know that you're, you're saved you're justified through faith alone uh, and so chapter 6 you know he was trying to contrast these two types of uh, uh, slavery and then Next week we'll continue with chapter 7 and he'll talk about an illustration from marriage uh, and I've used that already to talk about, you know, if, if you're married and, some, and the, your spouse dies, then you're no longer married to them, obviously. But that's like saying, you know, what happens when we are, if, if we have this relationship with, with evil and with death, when, when, we, uh, when a person dies, that relationship is broken. And so when we're baptized into Christ, and his death, then we died with Jesus. That means that the relationship with evil and sin has been broken, so we no longer belong to that. And now we're free to belong to someone else, and that is Jesus Christ. Okay, so we'll start at chapter 7, verse 1 next week.